this is episode 16 with Marcus Johnson. So let's go, 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 I follow, whoa, whoa, wherever you go, cause you're... Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of The Invention Show, a podcast about all things invention and reinvention, where entrepreneurs, leaders and authorities in the field today share their story of triumphs and challenges in both life and business. My name is Tak Lee, entrepreneur, investor, inventor, and the host of this show. Now, today, I'm totally honoured to have a very special guest with a powerful story to match. Marcus Johnson, founder of Flow Brands and Flow Wine, a Billboard chart-topping award-winning musician, a NAACP Image Award nominee, a lawyer, a best-selling author, keynote speaker, and serial entrepreneur. Also, not to mention a dad. Now, it's fascinating how he totally pulls it all together. Simply mind-changing, life-changing, and business-changing. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Marcus, and uh, thanks so much for being with us. Oh, Tech, thank you so much. It's, a, it's my pleasure to be with you. Awesome. Now, the first thing I'd like to ask uh, all my guests, Marcus, for those who are not too familiar with yourself, is can you please give us a window into your background? And now, uh, what was your first job? Oh, my God, man. My first job, honestly, was working... Um, with my father and a restaurant that he had, um, in, uh, he comes from St. Louis, Missouri and East St. Louis, Illinois. They're right across the river from one another. And, uh, my dad was deep in a barbecue. And, um, while, you know, I was listening to the list of things that you say I do, I got it honest from my dad, who was a PhD, uh, professor, um, psychologist, and we had a barbecue restaurant. So I learned entrepreneurship early uh, as a, a cashier for the business. And I used to go and help my father order, pick up food. Um, you know, I remember being eight, I think, and I helped my father uh, buy our first truck. I, I did all the mm-hmm. research for a brand new K5 Blazer back in the day at Chevrolet. <laughs> so, you know, um, I, I actually, you know, was, uh, I, you know, exposed to entrepreneurship very early in my life. There you go. Everyone has to start somewhere. Now, um, what got you into music, Marcus, out of interest? I know, I mean, you mentioned, you know, you come from a family of doctors and lawyers. So why music and in particular jazz? Well, you know, I can start with the jazz because I can't rap nor can I sing. Uh, <laughs> I would melt your headphones if I tried to sing. Um, and, you know, keyboard is something I used to watch my mom play. Uh, she played classical music. Um, you know, when she had a rough day, she would come in and her piano lessons stuck with her. So mm-hmm. I was introduced early to Bach and Beethoven. Uh, my mom could read music uh, at, at an incredible level. So um, I would sit under the piano and just listen to her play. But it wasn't really until... I was looking to get into the music industry and join a band in junior high school. Mm. And uh, literally um, also, you know, eighth, ninth grade, you start, you know, liking people having affinity. And I mentioned, you know, to myself, I was like, there's this young lady by the name of, you know, Jessica, that Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm going to write her a song and I'm going to teach myself how to play piano to do it. (laughs) And, um, you know, between, you know, necessity and love, they are the mothers of all, you know, in yeah, yeah. and one summer I went and, um, I had cousins that played and I looked over their shoulders and, uh, would run home, learn what they learned, what they taught me or what I saw in all the keys. And within three months I was playing pretty well and I made the job wow. playing at my school and, wow. uh, you know, the rest is kind of, you know, history. It's- Oh, that's amazing. Simply amazing. Now, now I believe, and, and I know you did go back and get your law degree and MBA out of your own sort of free will at the end. Can you please share sort of what triggered that, that decision? Well, you know, there, there are a bunch of things. One, you know, there's always this nagging voice that I think we all have. And as an undergrad in music, um, coming from the family and background that I did, there was always the, well, is this really legitimate? Um, yeah. And it absolutely, I mean, to, to, if, if all you have is a music degree, it's definitely legitimate. 
but I had a horrible experience um, with uh, a demo deal that I had with Lee Note Records when I was in okay. college and had no guidance. I had a high powered attorney, but you know, he was managing Luther Vendross at the time and working with Michael wow. Jackson. So I'm this little jazz kid with a deal, you know, with Blue Note and it really, you know, it, uh, let's just say he had he economies of time he had to put his time where his money was yeah and um so my demo deal didn't get converted uh into a uh, a full recording contract mm -hmm. and on the way back of a trans world airline you know 767 with tears in my eyes i said i'll never oh. be in this position again and nice. i was a junior in college and that's when i decided to study for my law school admissions test and um took that and I, I realized that this is a business um mm -hmm. everything that you do from whether you're a cook to washing cars to moving rocks or landscaping to investing it's all a business and the, mm -hmm. the, the core concept of how to run a business how to market to consumers um etc uh is it is it, 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 it transcends any particular industry it's everywhere we're all in business yeah. And I thought this would be a great way to help. Now, you're definitely uh, very well-rounded, uh, Marcus. Now, you made a lot of money, you know, selling records out of your or your basement, as I understand, you know, while finishing your law degree. And your first album, uh, Lessons in Love, where you independently, you know, produced and distributed, sold more than 40,000 albums, which is, you know, like a major success, especially as an indie artist and, and, and as a, a debut release. Can you please tell us and share for our listeners, you know, your first, um, I guess, you know, multi-million dollar deal and your and your run in with uh, Bob Johnson, you know, America's first um, African-American uh, billionaire with a, with a B. Yeah, man. So, um, you know, uh, again, second, first year of law school, I clerked at Universal Records in their general counsel's office and uh, VP of uh, Business and Legal Affairs as a legal clerk so i got a chance to see a lot of things there and the entire time my father was in my ear as i was talking about other artists and what they were doing he's like son you can do this you know this now right mm -hmm. technology allows you to do this you can go to a small studio and get this going so um you know my uh, second summer i turned down an internship at another major corporation and started going into the studio and i asked my sister for yeah. um you know some money and mm -hmm. she invested but she said back to me uh but i need to see your business plan of how i'm getting my money back <laughs> and so <laughs> that was you know the, the good thing about it is is like she never really asked for anything back she never looked for anything she just wanted to make sure that i understood the business planning process she's an executive um at a uh you know fortune 50 pharmaceutical company right now and an MD. And so she knew the importance of budgeting. She knew the importance of marketing. And she just wanted to make sure that I was thinking about that. So you fast yeah. forward a few years, um, you know, five or six uh, very successful records, uh, top 15, top 10 of Billboard, again, as an indie. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to headline the uh, Rehoboth Beach Jazz Festival. And I pull in and I see Bob Johnson getting out of the limo. And I'm saying to myself, huh, you know, opportunity, success, maybe today is one of those days. And, you know, I just smiled. So I'm sitting on a balcony and uh, looking out over the beach and somebody taps me on my shoulder and I turn around and Bob's like, hey, Marcus, it's Bob. And I'm like, oh. uh, <laughs> <you know? laughs> yeah. hey, Bob, you know what I mean? Hey, man. So, <laughs> what's up, brother? So, <laughs> So, you know, um, we started talking and he's like, look, man, I've had my eye on you for a while. You know, I play you in the BEC soundstage and I found out later from a lot of his uh, VPs and actually um, the president of BEC, who I worked with a little bit. He's like, man, Bob, all we were told was make sure you play Marcus Johnson videos and music and our stuff because he is on the rise. And that is the kind of people, you know, our kind of person that we want to represent at the BEC sound stages. So um, I invited him to lunch, uh, like, you know, every arrogant. You know, I was like, person. wow, that's a, that's a cool move. Right, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so and then he's like, yo, um, no, why don't you come to my office for lunch? And so we made that happen. And after a few hours of grilling me, um, and not even right, grilling me and not the food, <laughs> uh, he stopped and he said, how do I get involved in this? 
And that's when I knew I was on my way to doing my, you know, first uh, multi-million dollar deal. And, mm-hmm. you know, the success story really goes, it wasn't just that meeting and what I did in talking to him. Yes. It's through the fact that we had that conversation that he realized further that, okay, this isn't a fluke. This is something that I would invest in. This is somebody that I would invest in. Uh, you as an investor, you know yourself. The yeah. business is great, but really what you're investing in is the person. The person because if you have a great concept and a yeah. horrible partner, it's the worst kind of marriage you could ever have. And it's mm-hmm. hard to get out of those. Um, and I had worked months, actually years on my business plan. Uh, you know, he's like, this is the best business plan I've been presented with. You know, thank you, Georgetown, uh, Elaine Romanelli for helping me out with that. <laughs> but, you know, really putting the time in. I knew my business. I knew my stuff. And the opportunity met with the determination and resilience uh, mm-hmm. so that we could get the success. Awesome. Awesome. And also through my research on, on yourself, uh, Marcus, you know, something that really caught my attention, among a lot of other things. You mentioned that you're in the therapy industry instead of the music industry. Can you please elaborate on that? Yeah, exactly. I think um, so. Back in 2004, 2005, the music industry faced serious disruption, as did a bunch of industries because of the advent of peer to peer services and the evolution of the internet. It was really like Internet 2.0. Yep. Um, and I was reading a book, I think, on Common Ground. I think that's what it's called by Howard Schultz. And ha- when they were closing all of their restaurants, uh, you know, their, their, I'll call them restaurants, but all of their locations, mm-hmm. he said, we have to really figure out what business we were in. And he yep. said, we weren't in the coffee business. And he said that we ended up being in the third place business, meaning your, your house is number one, your office is number two. And your uh, Starbucks is number three. (laughs) And so it forced me to really think with declining sales in music and, you know, zeros dropping off of the back of of revenues, Mm -hmm. you know, every six months as it relates to a decline in, in revenue. What business, you know, are musicians really in? And, um, the business is really therapy. People use my music to feel better. They use it to cook better. They use it to love better. Mm -hmm. They use it to relax better. And anytime that you're inserting something into your life to enhance the experience, it is a therapeutic, you know, component in my, in my eye. So I tell people we're, you know, uh, uh, lifestyle enhancement therapists. Um, And then you can start looking at it so now I don't just have to do music. Now I can do music and wine, music and books, you know, music and uh, lifestyle experiences that incorporate wellness at, you know, major yes. resorts, et cetera, et cetera, those kind of things. Mm-hmm. But um, I think it's very key for every entrepreneur to not get in the industry that they're in, you know, just mm-hmm. use that as a, uh, a determinant, but to really dig deeper and to find out, you know, what business they're in, the deeper business. Yeah, no, that's totally, totally very, very, very interested in that one. Now, please correct me if I'm wrong, Marcus, but I understand you're working on a new book at the moment called Deeper, but I want to uh, bring up your first book, Flow, you know, For the Love of. I mean, it's, it's achieved Amazon's best selling book title and also best selling author. I mean, I love the intro where you say, in a way, I've been writing this book my whole life. For our listeners out there, can you please share what the book is about? The book flow is really about um, key concepts that allow you to be actively engaged in your life. Um, I think there are so many of us that feel like victims because we're disengaged from the life process. Um, we believe that politics happens to us. We believe that business and careers happen to us. We believe that something comes out of the sky called purpose, and then it hits us mm-hmm. over the head. And, you know, we, we all of a sudden, ha- you know, we, we have it and we have direction. Yeah. And my thought is that there's nothing further from the truth. You are absolutely involved in everything that you do. 
and your purpose is not over, you know, behind my shoulder or outside, you know, in my yard. It is for you to develop over time by taking risks, being resilient, looking at failures, transcending them, and turning them into experiences that you evaluate, which is called, you know, wisdom. And in order to do that, you have to have a life model. And so um, I, it's 14 chapters of just like, you know, for the love of crime, things that I learned out of crime, for the love of, of thyself, for the love of dreaming. Um, the idea that your dream has to be personal. It has to be yours. It can't be your significant others, sisters, brothers, mothers, fathers. Your dream has to be your dream. Mm-hmm. And as you go and you look at these things with a life model and you actually execute upon them, you can't help but be successful. When you take a seed and plant it in fertile ground and nurture it properly, it's going mm-hmm. to grow. And I think that um, that is a big failure in modern education and that we don't actively challenge our primary school children um, mm-hmm. and even early childhood education uh um, we in, in early childhood education, we don't um, challenge our three and four year olds to think for themselves and to begin to have some level of critical cognition. And I was just talking to my lady today about uh, going on a walk with my six year old daughter who explained to me, excuse me, eight year old daughter who explained to me today how she enjoyed the vice presidential um, debate much wow. more than the presidential debate because <laughs> it was. It was a catastrophe in the fact that um, neither, you know, there was a lack of respect in the um, in the presidential debate, but that even though, and she by name mentioned Kamala Harris and Mike Pence are contestants and competitors, that, um, you know, they at least allowed each other the opportunity to get their viewpoints across. This is my eight-year-old daughter, yeah. and the only way that you can get there is by challenging her early. Not she, I, my daughter is no smarter than any other person, right? Any other eight year old. What I believe is when you allow her to unlock her superpowers, we all have yeah. that same brain. When you allow them to unlock the finer and more uh, uh, elaborate synapses in yeah. their brain, they will give you beyond what you feed into them. And so um, that is you know, the essence of the book. And I mean, honestly, the book is written to Chase and all of the people who have their inner child out there to mm-hmm. say, it's never too late for you to take accountability for your mistakes, yes. forgive yourself for them, and mm-hmm. go decide to get your flow on. Wow, powerful. Now, you speak at a lot of conferences, you know, such as um, TED Talks, and especially at, at unis, you know, university for two students on entrepreneurship and, and the like. I mean, you were talking about, um, you know, building, I guess, resilient kids in a way so they can take that into um, adulthood. Can you share some, you know, some further insights there with regards to So how do we build resilient kids? Well, number one, I think the thing that we need to do is stop and look in the mirror every day. And the first way to build resilience is in yourself. And to, um, you know, again, if you take the deeper model, it is mm-hmm. dream, engage, environment, plan, execute, and reflect. Um, <clears throat> we're already, most of us, you know, very well skilled in having a dream. It may not be ours. Yeah. We go to work every day, so we're engaged in something. Our environment, mm-hmm. uh, maybe not so much. Yeah. We do not want to plan, especially a written plan. Um, and so anything can take us off of our plan and then we go and do it. And to me, that is a recipe for disaster. And when you're looking at like, I mean, would you invest, if I told you, I have sort of a dream, eh, sort of engaged in it, you know, you know, the people, my team, they're okay. You know, well, where's your written plan? It's here. And, but I'm doing something. You would not invest in them, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That is the life model that most of us have been given. So in order to, to build resiliency, it's just like building muscle resilience in the gym. You have to have a process and it has to be a regular process. And so in looking at life in the same cyclical kind of, uh, of manner, when you then apply deeper in the mirror, hey, what's my dream for the day? Am I on track? You know, 
I, I, me thinking about this today is enough engagement that that's all I can do today, which is great. Yeah. You know, my environment, I need to promote so-and-so and so-and-so because they're doing great things and helping me in my life. And I need to get rid of these other people, places, things, and ideas because they're a cancer. Yeah. And I'm going to write it down, not in a to-do list, but a success list. Success yes, list yes. is tied directly to my dream, right? Not, yes. not just, I think we're all, I think we're all right now in a trance of seductive busyness. I'm so busy. Yeah. You know, it, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so then, then when you do that on the daily, you go out and do it, and then you take the time in the morning, at night, to reflect on that. Mm-hmm. You begin to say, "Huh, this didn't work," and I'm not going to take it personally. Mm-hmm. It just didn't work. So, what do I need to change in this in order to make the new dream and the refined dream as I go deeper again? Mm-hmm. You know, how do I? What do I need to do to change to make that better? Maybe I'll adjust my environment. Maybe I'll adjust my level of engagement. Maybe mm-hmm. I need to get back to the written plan a little bit more. Maybe I didn't execute it properly. And then when you do that mm-hmm. and you write it down in a journal, um, you know, and again, not a diary, you know what I mean? Yeah. In a journal, I believe that the process, that resilience is a process. And that is something that we're just not taught. We're taught you're lucky. We're taught you're blessed. And even as a Christian, I believe that God gave us a brain and said, you are, and your entire body is based on a system that is tangible. And if it wasn't, you would not exist. And if it doesn't work the same way every day and continue to grow, then you would die physically. So take that and then apply it to your life. That's how you become resilient. Awesome. Now, great insights. Please take that on that one, listeners. Now, moving on to your journey, you know, as an entrepreneur, Marcus, how did the Flow brand come about? I mean, what is your direction there? You know, it's funny. I was sitting in an office one day and literally going from, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a month coming in to tens of thousands of dollars coming in and saying to myself, (laughs) okay, we have a problem, Ethan. The music industry is different. (laughs) You know what I mean? How How do we, you know, change this? And that's also part of the process where I decided to do a deeper analysis myself and to say, what business am I really in? What am I doing wrong and what can I do better? Mm -hmm. And we had a brand that was flow and it was for lovers only, but I knew that that was not scalable. And so I was kicking things around and kicking things around and all of a sudden it hit me for the love of. Mm-hmm. And, you know, um, I knew that I could create a brand, relationship, trust, et cetera, around the concept of for the love of. So went right in, you know, yes. did the trademark search, got the trademark stuff, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. did an intellectual property uh, secured and, you know, kicked a couple of ideas around with uh, friends and they were like, we love it. And my team loved it. Yeah. So we started off with the Flow Lifestyle series of CDs and music. And then mm-hmm. um, when you look at it again within the the paradigm or context of I'm in the therapy industry, yeah. then you can say, we have a solution for you. Not just music and food, mm-hmm. not just food and wine, but why not have a great Marcus Johnson of Flow CD along with the glass of Flow wine with your meal, lifestyle mm-hmm. enhancement. And yep. so we've gone from there to adding, again, the book. Now we have Love and Jazz Weekend that we do with Salamander Resort mm-hmm. um, around Valentine's Day, which is a wellness retreat, yoga with Marcus, cooking with Marcus. Yep. It's fun stuff that allows us a break because, again, we need mm-hmm. a break in order to get that therapeutic, you know, recovery um, because you have to be well rested and take care of yourself to be resilient. You can't be broke down mm-hmm. either. And so you put that in there and you mix all that together. It's really limitless as it relates to what you can do with that. You could be at the flow, you know, um, retreat at the flow vineyard, sitting in the flow lounge, listening to flow music, sipping on flow wine, et cetera, et cetera. I love it. Now, awesome. Absolutely love it. I just love how even the, you know, the font of flow, everything just, everything just flows. It's awesome. (laughs) Now, Thank you, man. Think, I appreciate that. thinking outside the box, you know, uh, Marcus, you know, people say it's important to think outside the box. So it gives you um, an edge 
I mean, you have a knack of not only thinking outside the box, but basically picking it up, you know, throwing it away and, and being in control of your own destiny and, and life as such. Does risk and fear, I mean, ever come into play or bother you? For, for those budding, budding entrepreneurs out there, I mean, how do you manage risk and fear? Risk and fear are probably two of the things that I visit with um, multiple times a day. Mm-hmm. Um, the idea is to make sure that you are courageous, which is not the absence of fear, nor will you ever have an absence of risk, but it's the ability to act in spite of your fear. Mm-hmm. I have the same fears of being uh, ridiculed. Uh, I have the same fear of failure. I have the same fears of, um, you know, things like imposter syndrome. Yes, I have a, yes. a law degree and an MBA and a this and a that. But wait a minute, do I, did, did I really get that legitimately? You know, yeah, I studied nine hours a day, you know, for two years. But mm-hmm. but did, did you really earn that? Um, are you sure? Every yeah. single day, every new deal. But then you understand that that is part of your fight or flight, where it's like, yo, look, if we just stay here, it's good here. Like, mm-hmm. who moved my cheese? Uh, the book, I don't know if you're familiar with that. But, you know, the one mouse sits back and like, this yeah. is good. This cheese is good. The other one's like, but this is going to run out. We need to go and, and, and find more cheese. Yeah. And so you have to then transcend, transcend the fear and the fear of risk, which always exists through faith. I mean, mm-hmm. and, you know, I don't necessarily mean, you know, just a religious faith, but a faith in the things that you've done. The faith in that what you can't do, that you can find somebody to help you do. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the, the faith in, God, I got up this morning and this opportunity is in my lap and it's in my lap for a reason. Let's figure it out. Let's at least give it a chance. And mm-hmm. many of us don't even al- uh, allow ourselves the chance to, to show ourselves, right? We jump back out of it and say, well, no, no, I'm going to stay in a comfortable cheese. I just tell everybody around me, challenge yourself to try new things. You will, this voice here, this yeah. is society. This is your ego telling you, well, if you do this and you mess it up, ooh, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, and the thing is, even as an investor, you know, we calculate risk into our deal. Yeah. And the things that you do anyway, because you believe in that entrepreneur, you believe in the concept and the risk you know, uh, the reward outweighs the risk and it might not just be financial. There, there are so many other things that can overcome risk. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Now you've also reinvented yourself, you know, multiple times through your, your journey, Marcus. I mean, I've been knocked down plenty of times and getting back up, you know, that extra once and going and going again. If your younger self was sitting at, you know, at one of your talks, what would you tell them? You know, I think about that all of the time. And the main thing for me is I was blessed with an incredible father who passed a few years ago. And my dad always told me, son, believe in your gut. There were a lot of times that I did not believe in my gut. Mm -hmm. And by not believing in my gut, I allowed other people who may not have seen it the way that I saw it. Like, again, I believe that you have a superpower in that the universe speaks to you through all of your experiences. Mm -hmm. I believe that the universe speaks to me in my unique way with all my experiences. And we can come together and even disagree in an amicable way where it's like, yo, I get where you're coming from, but I don't see that. Let me show you where I'm coming from and to fight more for my beliefs. And the mm-hmm. things that I knew I should have done that I allowed other people to talk me out of. Yeah. And uh, I mean, that's it. Trust yourself. Trust in the fact that when you do the reflection, when you go mm-hmm. deeper and you do your reflection, that you can say, dang, I did make that mistake. But dang, look what I learned from it, man. Yes. And 
it's time I'm going to go out there. I'm going to put my cape on with my superpowers of Marcus attack and watch me flow, mm-hmm. not fly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's actually talking about your, your dad, uh, Marcus, in your book, Flow. And uh, there was a quote, I think, in there from him that I absolutely love where he says, I think, uh, act the way that you want to be. And as soon as you will be, you know, no, hang on. As the way you soon, act. yes, you'll be the way you act. I mean, I had to read that a couple of times just to let it let it sink in. I mean, did you get it the first time when he told you? No, of course not. Yeah. And I mean, I think that is even in the uh, the component of the book where we're talking about. Um, oh my God, we're talking about you know, you know. But I'm just the way I am, right? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? That you know, I can't change. I'm I'm stuck with me. I'm stuck with, you know, the, this version of who I am. And, you know, my, my thought to that is like, that's BS with mm-hmm. a capital bull. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it is, it, you know, it, it got, it, it, the universe has laws and natural laws. And the law of assumption and the law of attraction are just as tangible as the law of gravity. It's just so that we see this drop here. Right. Mm. And it, the law of attraction may take a little bit longer, as with the law of assumption. But when I say yeah. assumption, it is assuming that you in your imagination where you're going to be in 12 months can actually happen. So when you start acting as if it, it's going to be that way, mm. um, an amazing thing happens. Things start coming out of nowhere. And, you know, the great they're great writers that write about it. I love Paulo Coelho in The Alchemist. Uh, yes, Alchemist. Yes. Right, right. Yeah, so he talks yeah. about, you know, living your personal legend, man. And like mm-hmm. when you live your personal legend, the universe conspires to make sure that all of it comes true. That is the law of assumption. We tend to think like, show me now, you know, mm-hmm. kind of back in the day, Eddie Murphy, what have you done for me lately? <laughs> yeah. And it's not, it, it's not about that. It is about you can do and be anything you want to be. Mm. And if you see anything out of my story, take that out of it, that I am a lawyer, that I have my MBA, that I have done multiple, you know, uh, a million dollar deals, that I went to school for music engineering, then went to school for music and business, then went to one of the top law schools and business schools at the same time while mm. I taught mm. at the law school at yes. Georgetown, all at the same time, and then put two CDs out at the same time. Mm. And then I graduated, and then I got these deals, and then I got into why. And people are like, well, you know, the, I guess you're a jack of all trades. And no, I'm a master of a couple player. Don't, don't, I'm not gonna allow you to belittle me and just because that jack of all trades is something that people say for those who lack imagination. I don't lack imagination and I'm not done yet. So, you know, if I'm not done yet, imagine what you can do just by saying, here's where I'm going to be. Like, if you take my class and you're at Georgetown or Howard or any of the other places, you know, where I've taught, you are not allowed to use the term, you know, uh, well, I want to. The only term you're allowed to use is a proactive, this is what I'm going to do. Because either you're going to do it or you're not, Pat. And so when you put all that stuff together, Mm -hmm. see what's possible. But that, wow. that's all my father said. Hey, son, anything you want to be, I know you can be it. Period. Mm-hmm. Wow. Just love it. Love it. Now, turning point, all points, uh, Marcus, you know, when you look back at your entire life, everything that you have, you know, in your journey and everything at the moment, can you pinpoint a point that changed everything for you? Or is it more of a collection of So this is going to sound really crazy. And I was talking to, to my lady about this Mm -hmm. um, because I've been asked this question before. And the most important specific day that I can point back to is Mm -hmm. being born to the parents that I was born to. And I am not disillusioned or under, under any illusion that that has not helped me to be exactly Mm -hmm. who I am. Um, you know, my dad coming from a poor background, achieving a PhD, my mom coming from a middle-class background, getting her master's degree, my mm-hmm. parents being entrepreneurs, you know, being me being born in the seventies in a time where 
you know, little, you know, brown babies and black boys could do, could actually say that they could do anything that they, you know, uh, uh, mm. wanted to do and then go out there and do it. And then having somebody that kind of just, just guided me back a little bit, you know, no, I'm not going to hit you hard. It's like, it's like steering a plane. You don't <laughs> steer a plane like this. You yeah. don't steer a plane like this. Mm. And my dad, my, my dad and my mom gave me those things um that a lot those 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 little uh um points of wisdom you know my mom coming to me and saying son it's time for you to stop chasing your dream and time for you to start working towards it Mm -hmm. um you know my sister feeding in the idea when i'm in junior high and high school early that i would be a great jd mba um again all that has to do with in the deeper model your environment is so key but then when you think about like well i don't have that i didn't have a great family there's a a great page by um napoleon hill and think and grow rich nice and it talks about the things that if i had right Mm -hmm. and he goes down it's like i know a lot of you all are like well if i had a good family if i had more money if i had this it's like the 50 the 57 (laughs) alibis right Mm -hmm. stop using these damn alibis as your scapegoat for why you are where you are. You have the ability, if you can come up with this this alibi, then you have the creativity and the awareness and the presence to create the plan to get you to the next phase. Mm -hmm. So that is on, again, but that means it's on me. And we are so, in this day and age, like we're so hell bent on pointing the finger at somebody else because we have not been taught to take responsibility for ourselves, nor have we been taught to forgive ourselves for our mistakes. Mm-hmm. that is why we are in a dangerous place right now and you know you see all the stuff in politics we mm-hmm. have to get back to saying i'm sorry yeah. mainly to us and and those around us and then to just committing to excellence in the process man yeah. and you know learning to ride new bike you know mm-hmm. it, it's all that kind of stuff you know what i mean where it's like yes. god I, and i got that i i got that from my family Love it, love it. So in interesting times like this, um, Marcus, what would your advice you know, or message for our listeners and viewers be? I mean, we've an audience from around the world and, you know, some places, you know, are starting to open up, some back in lockdown and the people general, you know, generally are still at home. What should people be doing right now so they can come out, I guess, in a way, a better person? Okay, can you repeat that? You kind of broke up on me a little bit. Sorry. Yeah, so... Uh, Yeah, I'm just saying, what should people be doing right now so they can come out a better person with everything that's happening in the world at the moment? You know, to tell you the truth, I think that what we have right now is a failure to listen. And I think that people would do so... Like, the world would be such a better place if... And, and if we just waited to hear the other person out, even in our, you know, even with our ideology, even with our thoughts of, of like, I don't agree with you, man. I don't agree with what you said there, Ty. So look, let's work together to find a way to find midpoint, case in point. I had to have a sit down with my child's mother the other day, mm-hmm. um, dealing with family law and dealing with how we're disposing of the custody of my daughter. Mm-hmm. And I went in with some anxiety because I was like, oh my God. But I also went in with a, a, a forgiving spirit and a spirit of, you know, thanks. Um, you know, our relationship didn't work out. And that's cool. We have a daughter that we need to be focused on. So you're talking through these points. And, you know, I think she almost fell out of her chair in one thing where I was like, you know, I'm sorry about that. You know, I was in a different place than I am now. And maybe that was insensitive. And, you know, I should have let you know I was in a long term relationship with somebody else Mm -hmm. and that, you know, we were moving in and, you know, that chase would be spending time here. I was in the wrong for not doing that. And I sincerely apologize for that. And you you could hear like a stop. And it was like, 
thank you very much for saying that because mm -hmm. I really, I, I kind of needed that. And I'm like, and you should get to know, you know, my lady because she's not going anywhere, number one. She mm -hmm. loves Chase, number two. And, you know, she doesn't want to be her mom. She just wants to be a support system for me. She has, you know, her own kids. Mm -hmm. you can, it doesn't get much more, you know, uh, adversarial than parents yeah. talking one-on-one -on -one about the disposition of custody for the child that they love because it generally gets personal yeah. and we're not listening. Mm -hmm. and, and by starting off by saying, what really matters to you? time with my daughter mm -hmm. okay so you know what hey i don't even need you and your family do a bunch of thanksgiving things all the time it's not really a big it's like holiday for me yeah. but you know christmas is let's compromise man let's mm -hmm. work together because we live on this planet together and i can tell you from somebody who i you know i haven't used the words hate often in my life mm -hmm. but to have a person where i had those kind of just very aggressive, distinct feeling to be able to say, this is not getting us where we need to go. This is going to cost us in the future and it's going to cost us in our daughter and what matters. Mm -hmm. I would tell people to really get down to the ideas, whether it's political, whether it's community, whether it's spiritual, whether it's personal, whether it's professional. Yep. Don't be afraid to have the conversation. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid, afraid to face the truth and be wrong. Yes. And I think that right now, so many people are so worried about just being right instead of what's right, mm -hmm. you know, being right instead of, of, of seeking the truth. And if you deal in the truth with a, 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 a mindset of fairness and forgiveness and kind of a, a loving spirit, it works. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah. for people, I'm sure listening to this, this, uh, this your podcast, you know, it's the, the consummate prisoner's dilemma game where, you know, you go and you end up screwing the person that you're negotiating with, but the team that wins is the one that actually, you know, didn't get the most points and that actually worked together each time they had to negotiate a deal. Yeah. This is what we need to be teaching our four-year-olds and our five-year-olds. Mm -hmm. Conflict, dispute, resolution, critical thought, their own ideas of who they are within the mm -hmm. context of then teaching them how to, you know, uh, achieve that and still add to the world. I mean, I think in this time, that is it. Community. Love one another. You know, we're, oh, in a, you can, yeah, yeah it, it, there's, mm -hmm. I could go on and on, but I, I, I don't yeah. want to take too much. <laughs> but so but it's like, you know, yeah, I could go on and on about that. Mm -hmm. But it's just, it's giving an F about yourself by caring about the other person yeah and if uh, we just gave a crap if i give a crap about you Pac, and you mm, know i do mm, and then i know you give a crap about me yeah we can we can rule the world man you know what i mean with yeah. your brain my brain the things we can yeah. <laughs> That's it. yeah man. Mm. Nah, awesome awesome so what is your legacy marcus what do you want to be remembered for the guy who used all that he, all of his successes and all of his failures and the wisdom gained um, through the life experience to help others to do the same. Um, and I think yeah. that that is my responsibility and I think that is my legacy. Uh, you know, teaching in a university as an adjunct, I'm not making any money. I'd, mm -hmm. rather, I'd probably make more money sitting at home kind of smoking a cigar than I would, <laughs> waiting for you know, getting places yeah, like I yeah. was. You know, yeah. I'm not doing that because I'm making money. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. giving back because it is my responsibility. And that I taught other people around the world that it is their responsibility to stay engaged, yeah. to be active participants in their own life, in their society. And that anything that they put their mind around with a life model, like a deeper, mm -hmm. allows you the ability to achieve anything with that, that, that falls under natural law. Yeah, awesome. 
Awesome. Now, the, my next question, Mark, because I ask this to all my guests, and it's very interesting, you know, the, the answers I get back. And you actually mentioned this a couple of times through our conversation. But the question is, what superpower do you wish you had and why? You know, I, I think about it a lot. And I believe, as I, as I mentioned, that I do have superpowers. And I, I believe that we all have superpowers. If I had a superpower that is beyond where I am now, it would be the ability, the ability to get people to stop oh. and open their ears and mind to listen. Mm -hmm. That is listening, number one, to themselves. Yeah. Listening to those around them who they care about. Listen to those who might be in opposition, but might have another perspective from which they need to view it. Mm -hmm. Listening to their body, listening, just listening to the universe, man. And if they, if we could just stop mm -hmm. and listen, it goes back to what we were just saying. What advice do I have for the world? Mm -hmm. Stop and listen before you react. Because my fear, Pat, is that mm -hmm. that is the power, that is the superpower of humans, the ability to be present, to listen, um, the ability to listen and forgive. Mm -hmm. But what we're doing right now is just reacting. Yeah. And when you're not, when you're, when you're reacting, that is not a human trait. Human being is about mm -hmm. being in the moment. That is being present for those around you and yourself. And the only way to do that is to take a break yeah. and listen. Awesome. And be in the flow. Always, uh, man. Yeah. <laughs> now, totally remarkable, um, uh, Marcus. And now, unfortunately, we have to work towards wrapping up and super mindful of your time. Now, phenomenal journey, uh, shares and words of wisdom. Really appreciate your transparency and authenticity. I've just got two last questions. Um, First is where can people find out more about, you know, yourself and, and flow? Uh, you can find out about me at MarcusJohnson360.com. So MarcusJohnson360.com. All of my social media, uh, Facebook and um, Instagram are MarcusJohnson360. If you go to Google and put in Marcus Johnson and wine, you can find out information about my wine brand. Mm -hmm. And we're about to do a whole new national relaunch on that. Yeah. Um, and if you go to buy, uh, well, if, if you go to Marcus Johnson 360, it'll take you to the book and the wine as well. Yeah. So, um, and, and I encourage, uh, people to interact with me on social media, uh, because I do respond and, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's how I've been getting a lot of my speaking engagements and things like that. I I'm, I'm around just to talk, man. I, I, I believe. So, so that's love, it. Yeah. love it. I'll definitely put uh, the and links the, in the show notes. Yeah, and the music is available there too, and also on mm. Spotify, Pandora, all the big services around the world. Yeah, awesome, awesome. And secondly, what parting words of wisdom would you like to leave for our listeners? Man, um, again, I, I would just reiterate the idea of making sure that you are always engaged in your life um, and don't allow anyone to make you feel that you are a victim of anything, not of government, because you have the ability in most democracies uh, to vote and your vote counts. Um, but, you know, the whole idea of finding a life model, for me, it's deeper. It's dreaming, engaging, mm -hmm. having a great environment, the P, a written plan, execution and reflection. Whatever it is, take your passion plus your life model. And when you do that, man, mm -hmm. it just can help but be successful. Um, listen to others, as I said, be as considerate as possible. Mm -hmm. And keep you in the equation. Ask yourself, man, how you're feeling. And you know, I heard I know they say it's only insanity when you answer. Mm -hmm. No, that is insanity when you don't answer. If yes. you aren't if you aren't feeling well, mm -hmm. go to the doctor. If you're not feeling well, go to your therapist. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Yeah. If you aren't feeling well and you need to work out, go work out. If you're not feeling well in a relationship, mm -hmm. 
study it, study why. And if you need to get out of it, get out of it. If you need to, to look at you and what you're doing and change things, but you are the most important piece to your puzzle. And maybe that is the, 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 the essence of it. Mm-hmm. Don't forget that you and how you feel about it. And, you know, the truth about where you are in life and in and, and your existence is the key ingredient to yes. your success and your happiness. Wow. Wow. Now, incredible insights, learnings, and knowledge there, you know. It would be totally awesome to uh, catch up in person one day at your living room experience, uh, Marcus. So I'm looking forward to that when we can actually fly. <laughs> so, um, and definitely. And I need yeah. to, get, I, I've never, I've never been down there, right? I've never been down there. You should come. Life. Yeah. I would yeah. love, I'd love it, man. Once this stuff, let's stay in contact. And once this is, we'll this do, is over, we'll do. Yeah. yeah. So thanks again, Marcus. I uh, really appreciate your time. So, yeah, my pleasure. All right, guys, I hope you've enjoyed this interview. You can find me at turn x and also on social media at i'm.tackley. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you in the next episode. If you're enjoying this podcast, please do make sure you subscribe and take a minute to leave us a review. Thank you. YOLO, YOLO, it's our show. Oh, oh, there's one thing we know with all our cargo. It's turning our hero.